Hey, Kobus. Welcome to the show. Hi. Thank you for having me. Thank you for meeting our smart and curious students at UC San Diego. A little background before we get started. Kobus and I met at X, the moonshot factory at Alphabet, around 2014. Back then, my organization supported Kobus's life science project. Uh, we worked together on very interesting ideas and、uh, kept in touch ever since. Kobus might tell you more about that those projects later in the show. So my guest last week was a mechanical engineer, and a designer for physical products. He mentioned this: everyone knows hardware products are hard to make. So you have a long list of software patent on LinkedIn, and I consider you as a software expert. So following the sentiment, what would you say about software? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I, I've worked on both hardware and software projects over the years. At Google, I I was a technical lead for a lot of the Android phones that shipped in the early days of of Google Samsung Galaxy phones, the Google original Google Nexus phones before they became the Pixel phones. And it's correct, hardware is hard. It is a complex process to design and manufacture hardware. And if you work in a fast-paced environment like mobile phones, there's very little room to miss the schedule or the deadline or to make mistakes. I think the the big difference between hardware and software is after you ship hardware, you can't really change it. If there's failure, hardware failure, then typically that means the device needs to be returned. But in software, you can patch it usually unless you have a bootloader issue or a firmware update issue. You're usually able to change it. And I think that's a double-edged sword. It makes it easier to fix things when it's obvious what's wrong. But because software is not a physical thing that you can touch, doing failure analysis on software is much harder than on hardware. It becomes more complicated.、Uh, you may have seen the news that Tesla pulled some of their self-driving features. A lot of software these days are powered by machine learned models, and it's not. Always obvious what is wrong with that model, and then going in and fixing it. And I've worked in various hardware projects where failure analysis was a really important part of being compliant. And failure analysis is a mechanical process that you can go through to try to identify a problem. But in software, it's much much harder. So, if you were to pick one word to describe software, what would that be? That's a tough question. Software is so diverse today. Pretty much everything has software in it: cars, refrigerators, watches, medical devices. I think instead of trying to pick a word, I think the way I would answer the question is: Is there、um, is software like a pure engineering process, or is there some creative component to it, some artistic component to it, some fungible component? And I think yes, having Had the opportunity to work on both hardware and software. I think product design and industrial design have large creative component to it, and software, to some degree, is not always seen as similarly creative to industrial design. But I think it's equally challenging and gives you a lot of opportunity to be creative. Even backend engineers, when they're building something for a database or a transactional system. There is a ton of opportunity to be creative and to solve the problem in many different ways. What advanced languages and development systems have given us is a pretty blank slate and a lot of control for a developer on solving a problem, and that in in itself creates infinite solutions to product requirement or a market requirement or a user requirement. And that, in part, is why software is so challenging because there's so many ways to to solve a problem with software.、That's、I don't know if that's、way. a good enough answer. No, that's beautiful. I love your answer.、Uh, I I probably wouldn't thought about the cre- creative is the word you would pick, but you know this makes perfect sense. Thank you for that. So I move on to the next question. We both worked at Google,、uh, which is a company constantly rated as one of the best place to work for. We then both left the company to pursue a new venture,、um, new adventure in 2017. So, if Google couldn't keep you, I wonder what is your absolute dream job? 
Well, maybe we should talk about why I left Google. I think Google is a great company. I really enjoyed working at Google. I thought it was an amazing experience. I got a tremendous amount of opportunity to work on very diverse things. I think for me personally, what's important is working with people that are smart and that are making a difference. And there's a lot of opportunity at Google to do that. But as companies get bigger, your effect on a problem space, your circle of influence gets drastically smaller. And if you are in management, like a director or a VP, then a big part of your job is to keep things moving forward in the same manner that they have been moving forward for the last three, four or five years. And so it becomes harder to innovate or make changes. You know, Google has tried many different products, but today search is still together with AdWords, their biggest driver of revenue and cloud is catching up. But compared to other cloud companies, there's a big gap between Google and for example, Amazon. And I think if you if you are within a big company and you work in a dynamic space like tech, and you are entrepreneurial, which I am, then at some point you have a itch that you want to scratch, something that you want to do or try. And within a large company, you just don't have the affordance to do that. And that's what I liked about X because it gave many people with entrepreneurial desire or skills to try many different things. And X has produced quite some interesting spin spin-off projects over the years. But even X is pretty big now. And so it was a personal decision for me. I mean, I I, I think Google is a great company. And so to answer specifically your question about my dream job, I don't necessarily have to work on something new or something that I think is going to change the world, but I do want to have an impact. I do want to see the needle move. If you work, for example, in search or or ads, getting a point, 5% increase or a 0.8% increase on revenue is really hard. And when you do it, it, you have to ask yourself the question, did I really have an impact? And doing that on a day-to-day basis in a startup is much easier. And that's part of the reason why I like smaller teams. So my dream job is working with smart people in a small team on a problem that's really hard to solve and then solving it. That's fantastic answer. Um, You know, our students, right, many of them online right now are about to graduate. Many people give them advice is follow your passion, you know. So it's a beautiful thing when a career and passion come together. But how did you figure out what do you want to do after school? And where did you start your professional career? I was very fortunate that I knew from an early age what I wanted to do. I, I got introduced to computers at the age of seven or eight and through various different types of computers and at that time computers had only eight kilobytes of memory but um, the magic was there the the ability for you to program it was there and um, I always thought I would become a doctor and prepared myself in high school and, and university to become a doctor but ultimately my passion was software and so I was fortunate enough to grow up in a time when the software industry was rapidly growing. And I got into the software industry and and has been very fortunate to always know what my passion is. And I have been a mentor to many engineers, UX designers, product managers um, over the years that have gotten into a career because it makes practical sense. You look at the job market, you work with an advisor in high school, or maybe you have exposure to these careers through parents or parents' friends, and you make the practical decision that seems like the best choice. And for a lot of people, there's no affordance for the passion piece because you may not even know what you are passionate about. And I don't think there's a right or wrong way to get into something. I think the important part is how do you measure if you're happy or not? And I don't think getting into your passion will necessarily be a direct correlation with happiness. Um, The flip side to working on a passionate job could also be that it's really hard. It may not pay very well and you may ultimately end up being unhappy. So I think the real question needs to be, how do you measure being happy and what is the right decision on going there? And if you're young, 
in your university, you need a network of people that you can depend on that will help you make this decision. Otherwise, it's really challenging. Thanks for the advice. So your career development and professional growth happened between you know, large corporations and small ventures. So based on your LinkedIn profile, you spend almost equal time on each side. So how many large companies have you worked for? Well, I've, I, I'm originally from South Africa, and I ended up working for a large bank slash consulting tech firm. In South Africa, there at the time when I went into the job market, there wasn't a lot of software engineering jobs on the continent uh, in general. And so you ended up either working in finance or transportation. But I, I ended up working in the UK and then working in Canada. And I've now worked for companies like IBM Research, uh, which is a division of IBM Corporation. I've worked for VMware and I've worked for Google. A big part of the reason why there's diversity in my career is because there's so much opportunity for somebody in tech or engineering to experience both sides of the coin. There's a tremendous amount of investment in startups in tech and has been for the last 30 years. And so that creates a lot of um, job opportunities. But then on the large corporation side, there's a real need for engineers. And that also creates a lot of job opportunity. And I've always kind of followed part of my passion to like work on interesting projects, but also looked at really meaningful opportunities within the tech space. And sometimes that landed as a startup and sometimes that being uh, a larger corporation. It, it, it is two very different worlds though. And I can understand why people might be interested in the contrast between the two. Yeah. Could you tell us more about the contrast from your experience? There are pros and cons to large corporations that um, are really important in the early stages of your career. Startups are almost like snowflakes. Every startup is different. And if you are lucky, you end up at a really good startup. But unfortunately, the startup failure rate is really high. And so the chances of you ending up in a startup that is going to fail is pretty high. And doing that early on in your career, a lot of people say, oh, that's fine. You have a lot of time to experiment and, and be successful. But in my experience, there's a lot of benefit to joining a large corporation and seeing how other people do it the right way. I was fortunate enough to work for IBM Research and there was a ton of really great examples of how to do software engineering and, and management. There was great examples of innovation within IBM Research. And when you're young and you can absorb all of that at a drastic speed, that's really beneficial. Similar with Google, I, was, I landed in Google at, at a tremendous amount of growth when the company was growing very quickly. And seeing that is like a once in a lifetime opportunity and experiencing and learning from other people who are able to leverage that growth to do amazing things is very valuable to observe and to learn from. And um, I see large companies as an opportunity for you to learn when you don't have the experience. And I see startups as the opportunity to have an impact. But if you, if you have enough experience to know what to do, and typically startups are understaffed and have to move very quickly. And if you work in a startup with little experience and there's nobody to mentor you or show you the way, which is hard because there's a lack of time in startups. That's usually the scarcest commodity. Then you're going to struggle. Then it's hard. And for a lot of junior people working in startups, they end up feeling frustrated and challenged on how to navigate within an organization that may not have the resources to support their learning and their, their own personal development. Where if you work in a large company, typically that's already part of the organization and it's easier. Yeah, what a contrast, you know, this, this two words sounds like very different. Then how many small ventures have you started and what happened to those companies? Well, I've started um, three startups by myself, and um, I've also been part of two startups before that. 
Um, one of them succeeded and was acquired by a large software company and that was in the 90s and that is marked as a success. And then my second startup in the O's, um, we ended up not finding the traction we needed and it failed. We didn't get acquired and um, we didn't have a product that survived. And now I'm at a company um, that has been in business for five years and is is doing well and um, the team is very good at what they do in healthcare and I'm very excited about having the ability to build a company from scratch that is uh, self-sustaining and, and starting to become successful. Um, some of the other startups that I've worked at, one of them failed miserably and the other one succeeded. Overall, my batting average is pretty good if you think that 90% of startups fail. But it's interesting because when people find out that you were at a startup, usually the first question is, did you make millions of dollars? And in some cases, yes, you, you make quite a bit of money. But in other cases, you don't because you the startup itself didn't succeed. And then their follow-on question is, well, what did you learn from the failure? And... That's a complicated answer to give because it's not always clear why a company failed. It's obvious that they don't have enough money to continue, but the reasons for bringing the company to a point where they're unable to pay people's salaries and they have to close shop is not always clear. And that's what makes startups so interesting and why there isn't a lot of books on well, here's the one or two things you need to avoid to be a successful startup because it depends on the market. It depends on the team. It depends on timing. You may have a great idea and a great team, but if you're too early, you're going to fail. And, and that's a very common reason for startups not to succeed. Wow. So we will probably get diving into one of those uh, stories later on. For now, you know, I almost feel like you worked on both sides you know sometimes i feel like you worked hard on startups and then you went to a large company for vacation and then you come back you know to <laughs> work hard continue that uh, journey again why did you you know make those switches from the small venture to large company and then come back well i want to make sure that in my case i didn't slack off at large companies um in fact I probably worked harder at Google than at some of the startups because working hard is a, is a factor of the company culture. And for Google specifically, um, there's a lot of motivation to push hard and, and deliver quickly. And it's woven into the, the team's culture or the organization's culture or even the company's culture. And so I, I've, I've learned that it's not a given that if you work at a startup, you work harder than a big company. Some big companies, you work really, really hard. But I mean, the, the switch for me was not, I didn't see it as a big company or a small company. I didn't see it as more mature or less mature. It was about the project. I joined IBM Research because I was invited to work on a search engine. And I thought that would be pretty cool. This was like 2001. And I knew somebody that worked at Elmaden Research Center and they said, hey, we're looking for software engineers and your type of experience. So we're building a search engine to compete with Google. And I thought that was super exciting. I, I want to try that. We ended up building Watson instead. And um, it, it's not the Watson that's available today. It's the Watson that beat Ken Jennings on Jeopardy. But it was a great experience. And optimizing for the project was a really good decision. Similar to when I joined VMware, I wasn't looking to work at VMware. My startup had just failed. I was taking some time to do other consulting work and to learn about different industries other than tech. And I knew somebody who worked at VMware in the office of the CEO and said, hey, we're trying to do this ambitious project to do screen sharing and, and we want to run Microsoft Word on an iPad and you have virtualization experience, can you figure out how to get Word on the iPad? And so I said, yeah, that sounds cool. That's a real challenge. I want to do that. And we succeeded and it's a big business for, for VMware virtualization and app virtualization. 
but and and again it was a good decision to follow the project and i can go on i mean whether it's a startup or a large corporation there was always some sort of idea that i was optimizing for um i think it's the the nature of how i got into computers in the first place i was attracted to the fact that there are cool things that you can do i've continued to use that as my fallback for making decisions and it served me pretty well up to now.